Welcome home to Radiant Life Church, where everyone counts. We're glad you're joining us for our online service today. Well, we've had the opportunity to attend a great Christmas concert, and we've hosted a Christmas party at our house, and I'm so excited about our upcoming Christmas Eve candlelight service on Friday, December 24th at 7 p.m., and we'll have a special Christmas Eve service for you online as well. That is so exciting. I always look forward every year to that service. It's just become a tradition for us and a tradition for our church family as well. Um, you know, this season is sometimes difficult for people. There may be someone out there today who just needs a Christmas miracle. And I just want to remind you of what the Word of God says in Mark chapter 9, verse 23. If you can, said Jesus, Everything is possible for one who believes. As we put our hope and our trust and our faith in God, we can believe that he is going to do what sometimes seems impossible for us. And I know that he can do that for you today. Absolutely. I often say that God is the God of the impossible, but the reality is he's the God with whom everything is possible. Yeah. Let's take a moment and pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are able to accomplish those things that seem beyond our reach and, and even seem impossible for us. You spoke the entire universe into existence and you know every detail of our lives and you care about us. So Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would give us great strength during this season. Bring joy to those who are downhearted. God, bring healing to those who suffer. And Father, bring restoration where relationships have been strained because nothing is impossible with you. Yes, God, I lift up our church family today, and Lord, I just pray your blessing over them. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just fill them to overflowing. And God, I pray that they would be reminded of the truth of your word and the truth of who you are, God, for you are always the same. God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know, God, that you can do the miraculous in their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a few minutes and worship together. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven. Christmas season. I just love this time of year. Not so much the long lines, but I do love the Christmas songs, the parades, the lights, the packages, and the Christmas tree. You know, it's been said you can know a lot about a person by the tree they have in their home, whether it's flocked or traditional, or what type of ornament it has. Here are some examples. If you only put white lights on your tree, you may be the kind of person who asks your house guests to remove their shoes. If you put multicolored lights on your tree, you're an extrovert. If you have homemade ornaments on your tree, you have lots of children. And if you have strung popcorn on your tree, you just have too much time on your hands. A yellow star on top, you're a traditionalist. Cut off top means you didn't measure your tree. A vague evergreen smell means you bought a healthy tree. And a strong evergreen smell seems that you sprayed the tree with too much pine salt. And just a plain smelly tree, well, 
there's probably a dead bird in your tree. You know, the Christmas tree is a cherished tradition. About a month before Christmas, around Thanksgiving, it goes up, although some of us do it later. Then there are the ones that do it way before Thanksgiving, but we're not going to go there. You know, in my former days in retail, I remember having to begin making room in July and August for Christmas merchandise, including Christmas trees, that would begin trickling in. You know, the Christmas story is an example of living faith. By believing and trusting in God, no matter where we may find ourselves, This Christmas, the skit guys help us witness his majesty through dramatizations depicting individuals who knew some of the people in the Christmas story. Today, we consider the perspective of the innkeeper's son. My pop had this way about him. It made me so angry. So I'd come to him with an idea. Could be big or small. Usually it was something I thought would spruce things up around here a bit. And every time, every single time, as if he were reminding me of something, he'd pat me on the back and say, thank you, boy. (laughs) Then he'd go on about his business. (sighs) It's just his way. You know, a lot of people didn't know it, but, Bob couldn't read. Now, he'd have me do his reading for him. I remember that day that he came in. He, he, he came to me with a, a notice that had been uh, tacked to the front door of the inn, saying that the government was calling for a census. Well, I didn't have to read that all the way through to know what that meant. Yeah, it meant that people from all over were about to arrive in droves, and they were going to need a place to stay. I said, Pop! We got to get busy. We got work to do. We need to expand our footprint. This little inn of ours is only going to hold a handful of people. I I even drew up plans, pushing for profits in every corner that I could. I was ready. Yeah, I knew it. It was time for me to take over the family business, become the innkeeper. (laughs) I was 14. The pop patted me on the back and said, thanks, boy, (laughs) and went on about his business. It wasn't long before Bethlehem was busting at the seams. Oh, gosh, we'd never seen so many people. And where was I? Yeah, I was washing linens and sweeping and cleaning out the stables. Picture this, I'm standing there in the stall, the door opens, I turn and see them standing right there. This, this poor man and his wife, and she was great with child. Yeah, yeah, she's pregnant, and Pop told them that they could stay in the barn. <laughs> he lost his mind. There the three of us were. Me, this panicked husband, And this woman in pain, and I knew what that pain meant. It meant that baby was coming, and it was coming now. So what did I do? I was 14. I didn't know what to do. And then, (laughs) in walks Pop. He's got blankets and water, and he's handling it. He was doing what he always did, (laughs) saving me. And that night, he saved them too. (sighs) You could never convince Pop that he was a hero that night. No, I can still hear him. He'd say, Boy, all I did was make room that night. The hero that night was God coming down to save us all. All I did was make room that night an innkeeper making room for a miracle to be born, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
I would propose a question to you today. Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? As we continue in our series, Witness His Majesty, let's look together in Luke 2, verses 1 through 7, and discover how to make room for a miracle in our lives. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from there, the town of Nazareth, to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for giving your son, Jesus Christ, to us to come and to be able to live inside of us. Father, today, as we discover your story, Lord, this magnificent story in the Bible that you've given us, Lord, I pray today that it comes alive. And Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts now and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in discovering how to make room for a miracle in our lives, let's back up one chapter where we read in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give you the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant. And Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. You know, Mary's response was a human response. She said, How can this be since I am a virgin? You know, it's okay for us to have those human thoughts, those human emotions. It's okay for us to wonder when we get bad news or go through a trial or experience disappointment and ask the question, how can this be? God, how can this be? You know, I love the answer that came from the angel. Luke 1.37, for no word from God will ever fail. Reminding us of Matthew 19, 26, where we read, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with God. And then Mary said, may your word to me be fulfilled. You know, we know that the Christmas story is true. It really happened. God conceived a miracle in Mary. And nine months later, Jesus was born of a virgin. But let's look at this concept in our lives for a moment. God wants, no, he desires to birth Jesus in all of our lives. Another way of looking at this is in this question. Does God want Jesus to come into our lives, to grow within us, and then for us to deliver him to the world? I believe so. Therefore, if that is the case, what's the first thing that we must do to let God conceive in us a miracle? exactly what Mary did in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, when she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That is what we have to do. 
This is what I want us to do today. Whatever miracle you are believing God for, whether it's this Christmas season or even next year, I want us to do the very same thing that Mary did. When God shows up and puts a word in your heart, I want you to say, may your word to me be fulfilled. <laughs> you know, some may say, hey, Pastor Tony, if an angel would show up and talk to me, you know, I, I would have a lot more faith to believe it. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos. It simply means a messenger. So I want you to think about all the times that you've been to church or, or been to lunch with a friend and you felt like God was speaking to you through that person. And in other words, that person might be a messenger of the Lord. So the first step is to allow God to conceive a miracle in our lives like it happened to Mary. God wants you to conceive a miracle in your life. God wants you, in another word, to be, get pregnant. We may have to stop for a moment and pray for a miracle right now because somebody just passed out. But he wants you to have a miracle inside of yourself. Let's look back at Luke 2, verses 3 through 5. All returned to their own ancestral towns to be registered for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Mary was carrying her miracle. God wants you to carry the miracle with faith. We talk about the virgin birth, the immaculate conception, then Jesus' birth, but we seem to forget about the process in between. From the time the angel spoke to when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and she conceived to when she birthed Jesus in that stable, we don't seem to talk about the nine months in between and reflect on that process. Let me remind you, there is always the process. The carrying of the miracle before the completion of the miracle. And in other words, there is a conception of the miracle where God puts a word in your heart. Then there's a time when that word comes to pass. But in between is the pregnancy season. It's the carrying of the miracle. It's the believing God time. And it's not always easy. That's why it matters who you hang around with. Watch this. The very first thing that Mary did when she went to her cousin Elizabeth who was also carrying a miracle. Think about this. She got around other people who believed in miracles, who believed in God's miraculous power. How do I know? Because Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist. This too was a miraculous conception because Elizabeth had been barren. So one of the first things you can do if you're going to carry a miracle that God has conceived in you, that word that he has put in your heart, is to position yourself around other miracle carriers. She got around some of those who would believe God with her. She immediately got around Elizabeth. And the Bible says that she spent three months with her. But think about this. There were some tough times ahead. She goes back. She's now pregnant. She's showing. She's engaged to be married. Think about Mary's story. We have to ask the question, how many people even believed her story? Her story was that the Holy Spirit impregnated me. I wonder if someone said, yeah, that happened to my friend Matt's girlfriend too. You know, she didn't have it all roses like we think. She had the thorns along with the roses. I'm sure people mocked her, made fun of her, ridiculed her. People looked down on her, but Mary, oh Mary, held on to the word of God. We must come to that place that if we are going to see a miracle delivered in our life completed, we not only have to say, be it unto me according to your word, and allow God to conceive that miracle in our hearts, but we must carry that miracle with faith, living faith. I want to encourage you, whatever you are believing God for, carry that miracle with living faith. Let's look back at Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Look at Mary's story. It doesn't always happen like we think it should. 
She rides on a donkey for several days while she's nine months pregnant. And when, when they get there, they discover there's not a room available at the inn. In your house, you may have a manger scene with a wood stable and Mary and Joseph and a baby Jesus. Just throw that out of your mind for a second. Not out of your house, just out of your mind. Because we're not talking about a holiday inn or a day's inn. In ancient times, inns were called caravanseries. They were square structures where people would sleep on the outskirts of the square. And in the middle was an open courtyard where the animals were kept and fed. So there were no rooms available in the outskirts of the structure. So they ended up in the public square where the animals were kept and fed. Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger. The word manger means feeding trough. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloth, and laid him in a feeding trough. For Joseph and Mary, it was anything but a silent night. You know, maybe the song really should have been, noisy night, crazy night, all is frenzied and all is gloomy. You know, maybe that's really what it was like. The reason I'm telling you this is because your miracle may not come like you may think it should. Even though God completed the miracle, you need to know that it may not always come like we think. Let me encourage you today. God wants to complete a miracle in your life. You have to receive the miracle. Let it be conceived in you. You must carry the miracle in faith. Then when God completes the miracle, know that it might not be like you thought it would be. But pastor, you don't understand. Mary was a virgin. I'm not pure like that. I've got a lot of this past, this baggage, and it's not good. But I'm here to tell you today, God has washed you clean if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior and asked for his forgiveness. So God has made you a pure vessel that he may put a miracle inside of you. Think about what Mary did. She delivered Jesus to the world. I'm praying that 2022 will be a year that we deliver Jesus to a lost and hurting world. That's why it's important to share life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, the very first prophecy of Isaiah is found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where we read, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. As the innkeeper reminded us, the hero that night was God coming down to save us all. So today, let's make room for Jesus. Allow God to conceive a miracle in you. Carry the miracle with faith because God wants to complete the miracle in your life. So is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You know, there is a story of a police officer in England who heard the voice of a crying little boy who was lost. He was sitting down on the side of the road. So the police officer walked up to him and said, I'll take you home. Where do you live? But the boy couldn't remember and still sobbing, he looked up at the officer and said, Please take me home. Take me home. The police officer knew he had a problem. He started naming streets and shops, but the boy couldn't remember. The officer looks up and sees this cross. There was a famous landmark church with a lighted white cross on top. So the policeman pointed to that cross and asked, Do you live anywhere near that? And the little boy's face lit up, recognizing the cross. He said, yes, take me to the cross and I can find my way home from there. You know, this is true for your life. If you come to the cross, you will find your way home from there. Your home, that place where God forgives you and receives you just as you are and washes your sins away. Best gift given is given from God to you. His son on a cross and all he wants from you is you, your life. So today, God is giving you a chance to get real with him. And it's simple. All of us have fallen short in thought or deed. We have sinned against a holy and perfect God. You can't make it go away. You can't fix it. So God sent his son to be born as a baby and to grow up 
and live that perfect life, then die an atoning death on the cross so that if you just trust him and believe in him and look to him, you will be saved and adopted as one of his own children. You will come into a relationship with God and be with him forever. This is the gospel. And if you are willing to do that, I want to give you that opportunity to receive his gift. Perhaps you need to take the first step today in the right direction and begin following Jesus. And it's really simple. It's simply admitting that you have sinned. Then you believe in Jesus, that he came, that he died, he was buried, but three days later, he rose again for you and me. And then you choose and say, Jesus, you're my Lord. Because Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for speaking to us. And we come to you, a holy God, knowing that we have sinned. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Wash us clean. Today, God, we choose you. We choose to believe that you came, that you died, and that you rose again. So, Father, we give you our life. I give you my life. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed with me, please send an email to prayer at rlclodi.com. At Radiant Life Church, our mission is to share life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And this Christmas, let's help others witness His majesty through our living faith. We know that the best is yet to come. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. like a hurricane and I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us are his portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes and if his grace is an ocean we're all seeking so heaven beats earth like an unforeseen kiss my heart turns violently inside That he loves us Oh, how
surprise Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes And if his grace is an ocean Then we're all sinking So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss in my heart
Jesus, your name is power. Breath of living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and days and days to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you.